Hello, and welcome to the newest episode in Dialogue Topics. I'm Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. This season, we're talking about the history of LDS scholarship on specific themes, exploring a topic in depth to consider how Dialogue has been a forum for these important issues since its founding. We'll also bring you up to date on these topics with our more recent issues to discuss some of the current trends. All of our topic pages are curated to bring you comprehensive collections of annotated scholarship and may be found at dialoguejournal.com slash topic pages, all one word, or navigate there from our homepage. There, you'll find amazing resources and research on tons of issues. This month is March and is Women's History Month. With that in mind, I wanted to take some time to talk about the role that dialogue has played in Mormon women's history, including marking the birthplace of modern Mormon feminism in 1971 and continuing to be a hub for groundbreaking work on Mormon women's history, feminist theology, and cultural analysis of gender in the LDS tradition. Did you know that there are at least eight issues dedicated to this topic from 1971 to 2019? in addition to many standalone articles. In fact, there are so many that this podcast episode is really just scratching the surface of thousands and thousands of pages of published material. Now, I should note that I have spent a lot of time thinking about Mormon feminism. I've written a bit about it in my own book on 20th century gender and my articles on Mormon feminism and Heavenly Mother. And I've co-edited the Rutledge Handbook of Mormonism and Gender. I consider Claudia Bushman, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, and Judy Dushku friends and mentors. I thought I knew a lot about this topic. After researching for this podcast, I realized that I uncovered even more new gems, and I started to see the role that dialogue has played in this history in a new light. In this episode, I'm going to walk through this history in four major phases. First, I want to talk about the role that dialogue played in the foundation of Mormon feminism. This introduces us to some of the key figures over the last 50 years. Then, I want to talk about the conflict that feminists faced between their values and their loyalty to the church during the years that the church was opposing the Equal Rights Amendment, as well as some of the fallout. In the 1980s and 1990s, feminists and church leaders came into more open conflict once again. Finally, I want to review the scholarship on this issue over the past few decades, looking at Mormon feminism in the new millennium as it appears in the pages of dialogue. Act 1. Mormon Feminism Reborn When we talk about the founding of modern Mormon feminism, There are two contexts that I want to mention here. In our last episode, we noted how dialogue was born in the context of the civil rights movement, but 1966 is also right in the middle of the rebirth of feminism in America. This is the first major context. By the 1960s, we begin to chart what was generally referred to as second wave feminism. If the first wave was the 19th and early 20th century around white women's voting rights, The second wave dominates the 1960s and 70s as women are calling for equal treatment in the workplace, at home, and in their religious traditions. No doubt Mormon women all over the country were being influenced by these broader cultural shifts. However, the Mormon women in Boston were particularly moved and began to organize. In 1970, they came together to discuss these issues. The second major context that has to be understood is that church leaders in this period are really emphasizing what they called the patriarchal order. This isn't just a holdover of old values, but actually is a new, reassertive patriarchy that was dismantling the Relief Society's independence and putting into place all sorts of new policies and programs that would ensure male leadership. Women are actually losing power in the church in the post-war period. It was in this context that the Boston Women's Group first began to act, creating an independent funding stream for the Relief Society in their area. (music) 
Dialogue co-founder and co-editor Eugene England was based in Stanford, California, but was visiting Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1970. Claudia Bushman remembers walking with England and Laurel Thatcher Ulrich on the Harvard campus one evening and pausing near the Widener Library. I just blurted out that there shouldn't be a women's issue of dialogue and that we had a group who could put it together. According to Bushman, England liked the idea. I expected more of a hard sell, she recalled, but he just immediately agreed and said to go ahead with it. The result was the now famous pink issue of dialogue. It was edited, illustrated, and written by that group of women in Boston. And it marks the official beginning of modern Mormon feminism. Devery Anderson has written, The pink issue was the first public sign that a feminist movement within modern Mormonism had been born. The editors of Mormon Feminism Essential Writings, Joanna Brooks, Rachel Steenblick, and Hannah Wheelwright, wrote, The pink issue of dialogue, as it would later be known, struck a warm, frank, and bold note to mark the beginning of a new era in Mormon women's history. It's fascinating, looking back on this issue, now 50 years old. It was controversial, but it wasn't confrontational. This wasn't the Udall letter on race and the priesthood, but rather an attempt to start a conversation and to emphasize compatibility. Claudia Bushman wrote that they were committed to the compatibility of the gospel and feminism. It covers everything from housework to education to respect in church. Quote, The issue seems pretty innocuous now, but the whole project was still pretty threatening, insisted Laurel Thatcher Ulrich 30 years later. Some women didn't want to be associated with something that might make them seem critical of the church. Others thought that we were not being bold enough. I think we were just trying hard to be ourselves. A lot of this was just women telling their stories, and Ulrich was right about how it was received, despite the fact that this issue is now legendary. Responses assailed the idea of a middle ground, some saying that it wasn't faithful enough to the role of women as mother, and others that it wasn't radical enough by praising singlehood and childlessness. One response from a single 25-year-old male in the letters to the editor in the next issue is a classic case of mansplaining. The penchant for autobiography in this issue led to a lack of systematic analysis on the problem of women in Mormonism in general. Richard Sherlock was the author. He critiqued Claudia Bushman for being pro-marriage and pro-family in her feminism. A letter from the summer of 1972 said, The women's issue followed the church line, ho-hum. Another letter from that same issue, Mr. Sherlock was not the only person who had great hopes for the issue on women and came away disappointed. At least it was a beginning. Raising children is a challenge. Mopping the floor is a bore. Talking about it or writing about it is a deadly bore. Please, just because we are women does not mean that we are interested in hearing more about housework or cooking or diapering. It's bad enough we have to do it. These disagreements continued for years afterward. By 1974, the women in Boston organized by starting their own publication. Not a scholarly journal like Dialogue, but a magazine that featured the arts, poetry, personal voices, and more. They named it Exponent 2, named after the Women's Exponent, the 19th century Mormon feminist publication that these women had discovered in the stacks at Harvard's Widener Library and had been astonished to discover their feminist foremothers. Bob Reese, then the editor of Dialogue, reflected on the pink issue and the first issue of Exponent 2. Frankly, I am still somewhat disappointed that the pink issue was not bolder and more far-reaching in its attempts to speak to the serious problems of sexism within Mormonism. Your approach and tone may have been more practical and realistic, but personally, I would have liked a little more boldness. That is, by the way, the same objection I have to the first issue of Exponent 2. It seems to be trying so hard not to offend that it comes off pretty bland. Dialogue's letter to the editor section became a place to talk about the new venture of Exponent 2, the second independent Mormon publication after Dialogue. Complaints extended to Exponent 2 after the inaugural issue in 1974. What a contrast to Exponent the original. Exponent 2 is timid and tentative, where its namesake is forthright and assertive. The difference is due to the fact that 19th century Mormon women didn't question either their rights or their independence, 
both of which were hard-earned, and contemporary Mormon women seem uncertain of both. The history that spans these two publications has to be among the most intriguing in the annals of women's studies. So I want to point out that the birth of Mormon feminism had a rocky start, but it foreshadowed the very struggles that it would often find itself in, too radical for some, too conservative for others. But the existence of Exponent 2 didn't mean that Mormon feminism disappeared from dialogue. Dialogue continued to be a place in these early years to discuss the major issues of Mormon feminism. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, you'll all recall that race and the priesthood was heating up as a topic in the church and in the pages of dialogue. The question of women and the priesthood wasn't far behind. In summer 1974, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich writes an essay about why she doesn't want the priesthood. If the priesthood were a profession, I'd feel differently, precisely because it is blatantly and intransigently sexist. The priesthood gives me no pain. One need not be kind, wise, intelligent, published, or professionally committed to receive it, just over 12 and male. Thus, it presumes difference without superiority. I think of it as a secondary sex characteristic, like whiskers, something I could admire without struggling to attain. A letter responding to Ulrich said in fall 1974 issue, I was shocked to read Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's short piece in the most recent issue of Dialogue. She states that the priesthood is blatantly and intransigently sexist and that therefore the priesthood gives her no pain. She says she feels no urge to struggle to attain it, but the entire tone of her note suggests she is yearning to have the power which the priesthood represents and resents the fact that she cannot get it in spite of being perhaps better qualified in terms of spiritual gifts than many males who have it. While I do not question Sister Ulrich's spiritual gifts, she seems to have missed a point fundamental to the order of the kingdom. The male has the right by blood to preside over the female in righteous dominion. It is the females to uphold the male who presides in righteousness. The sooner Sister Ulrich and other sisters in the church come to accept this fundamental principle, the happier they will be. I, for one, am glad that Laurel didn't listen to this advice. In these formative years, LDS feminists were finding their voice in a number of ways. First, they were reclaiming their past. Women's history becomes an important part of this movement. It isn't an accident that both Ulrich and Bushman go on to be leading historians of America and Mormonism at Harvard and Columbia, respectively, with women's stories at the heart of much of what they do. Second, they're telling their own stories and being authentic to who they were as Mormons and as feminists. Third, they understand the power of organizing. They not only produce a founding document in the pink issue, but put forward a number of other publications, including Exponent 2, and some groundbreaking historical articles in an edited book from this era. I'm proud that Dialogue was the venue that helped launch modern Mormon feminism and continues to be a home for these critical conversations after more than 50 years. This is Linda Hoffman Kimball of the Dialogue Foundation Board. This is Aaron Brown. I am Chris Kimball. My name is Dalen Amasimaku, board member of the Dialogue Foundation. For nearly two centuries, the Mormon tradition has produced a proud corpus of thought and culture. For the last 50 years, Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, has been the primary repository for the best of that tradition. As individuals have attempted to find new ways to be both Mormon and modern, Dialogue has provided the arena in which these conversations could take place. Dialogue's board of directors has made the decision to make all of the journal's content free the moment it is published. While we are fortunate to be in the position to make this transition, we are asking for your help so we can continue to do so for the next 50 years. Traditional readers can still subscribe to our quarterly print journal, but we also have a new donation model that allows readers to pledge a particular amount per month to support Dialogue's mission. Go to dialoguejournal.com forward slash subscribe to pass along the gift of Dialogue's deep, thoughtful analysis to a new generation of readers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.